For the past 30 years, the MacArthur Foundation has given what are commonly described as genius grants. You can be of any age, working in any field. There is no warning that you are even being considered. Uh, and then one day, bingo, here's $500,000. You show exceptional promise in whatever it is that you do. Go do more of it. Go do more of whatever it is you want to do with this no strings attached half million bucks. The people who get a genius award each year, the list of folks when it comes out, these tend to not be very well-known people. I mean, there are exceptions, but most of the names are not names that you instantly have heard of when they win the prize. But if you look at the list, right, the further you go back in time, the more MacArthur Genius Grant names you do recognize from the old lists. And that makes sense if the Genius Award recognizes people who show great potential, right? The idea is that they will get to be famous later. This year will be the 31st year of MacArthur Genius Grants, 31 years. Our guest tonight for the interview received his MacArthur Genius Grant 30 years ago, in the second year that they were giving them out. As a professor of physics at UC Berkeley, as a senior scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, as a multiple award-winning physicist, it was a big deal that someone as highly esteemed and accomplished as Professor Richard Muller described himself as a skeptic on the issue of climate change. He argued that there were problems in the data about global warming, and he doubted whether global warming was happening. Because of those views, it was not necessarily a surprise that when Professor Muller launched a new project to study the veracity of global warming data, his single largest private backer was the Charles G. Koch Foundation. The Koch donation provided almost a quarter of the program's entire budget. And yes, that is Koch as in Charles and David Koch, the Koch brothers, the conservative billionaires who got that way by inheriting their father's oil and chemical company fortune. They are oil zillionaires. And while, of course, their funding of this project did not come with strings attached, frankly, the Koch brothers do fund a lot of what happens on the global warming is a hoax side of things. But Richard Muller's latest study was an independent scientific endeavor. And its results are the opposite of in accord with its funders' political positions. When Professor Muller was invited to testify before a House subcommittee in the environment last year, he reported there that contrary to his previous beliefs, contrary to his expectations, his preliminary analysis showed that indeed there is a global warming trend. Then six months after delivering that information to Congress, Professor Muller declared publicly that global warming is real and... He said he was no longer skeptical of the data about which he had once voiced doubts. A new study finds global warming is real and that the science behind it is not impacted by bias, bad data, or cities that act as heat islands. The existence of global warming, I think, is pretty much beyond dispute now. I think we have closed the last remaining questions on that. Mueller's study is getting a lot of attention because it was funded in part by a foundation backed by Charles and David Koch. They are oil billionaires and climate change deniers. Today, no one can deny that extreme weather is here to stay. That was last November. That was a bombshell. Now here's another. Look at this from the New York Times this weekend. Richard Mueller writes, call me a converted skeptic. Three years ago, I identified problems in previous climate studies that, in my mind, threw doubt on the very existence of global warming. Last year, following an intensive research effort involving a dozen scientists, I concluded that global warming was, was real and that the prior estimates of the rate of warming were correct. I'm now going a step further. Humans are almost entirely the cause. Joining us now for the interview is Professor Richard Muller of the Berkeley Earth Surface Temperature Project at UC Berkeley. His new book is called Energy for Future Presidents. Professor Muller, thank you very much for your time tonight. It's nice to have you here. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Uh, but first, let me ask, uh, as, especially as a non-scientist, if I screwed any of that up um, in explaining how you've got to this position you've just detailed in The Times. No, I think it was accurate, except for the characterization of the Koch Foundation, which always gave us a completely open hand and indicated no preference for what our... Uh, results would show. Fair, that's fair and smart of you to point out, and I appreciate you doing that. I do. I, I did try to insist that we, there was no implication that there was any funding, uh, strings attached to the funding. Uh, but I think, as was noted in that NBC Nightly News report as well, the fact that they were among your, far, your, your funders is part of the reason why I think your position on this, your evolution on this, has received so much attention. Do you, do, do you see why people might put that sort of political shine on what it is that you've done? Well, I, I, we try very hard to be uh, objective and non-political. 
Uh, I, we're hoping that by doing so and, and, and sticking by the highest standards of science, that we will help cool the debate and bring together everybody. Uh, science is that small realm of knowledge on which universal agreement is possible and likely. And I'm hoping we can settle the science so the more contentious issues, what to do about it, can, can then be debated. On that point, why, in, in your words, is it important uh, to know specifically if and how much humans are the cause of, of global warming? Admitting that global warming is happening, obviously, is step one. Why is this second step so important in terms of, uh, of policy and coming up with a way to cope with this as a civilization? Well, uh, if we are at cause, we can do something about it. Uh, if we're not at cause, if it's the solar variation, which we ruled out in our in our current study, uh, then it, it, it's hopeless. We just have to wait for it to happen. But if we're causing it, uh, we can do something about it. And I personally am concerned, not with the current global warming, which I think has been quite small, but real. Uh, it's with the future global warming uh, that, that the danger lies, and we need to recognize where that's coming from and then look for a solution. What were some of the other factors uh, besides solar variation? Uh, people commonly describe that as sunspots. Some of the other uh, areas that you thought might have inflected the data um, in the past that you were able to rule out with this current round of research. Well, the, the main one uh, is uh, variation in the sun. There were volcanic eruptions which have affected the climate, and we see those very clearly. But they're short-lived. A volcanic eruption tends to cool the planet for about three years. We were concerned about effects such as El Nino and the Gulf Stream, and those cause variations, too. We were able to see that, but they also tend to be short-lived. The remarkable thing was when we took those out, that the solar variation, the fingerprint of solar variation was just absent. And then we looked for the other things. We tried various different fits to it. The, the shock to me was that the carbon dioxide curve was right on. Uh, at, at that point, uh, I, was, I, I was very surprised. Uh, I had been, I, I like to think, completely open-minded. And so when we got that fit in a relatively simple way, in something that doesn't require elaborate computer programs, uh, the curve of, golden, of global warming simply matches that of carbon dioxide. At, at that point, my opinion finally formed. You go out of your way to say that correlation is not causation, but that this correlation is very strong, that something else needs to correlate better with the data if it is going to be an alternate hypothesis, an alternate explanation for, for, for why the temperatures have gone the way they have. Given what you see in the correlation between carbon dioxide and temperatures, do you think that the, the level of reduction we'd have to have in carbon dioxide is so great in order to affect temperature that it would have to be a global economic shock? Or would we, would we be able to reduce carbon dioxide in a way that you think could be economically sustainable but would still oh, really oh, affect temperature? I think there are two key things that we can do. Uh, one of them is a, a global effort towards energy efficiency and conservation. I think that's realistic. But the biggest thing is, and, and, and this, uh, this will be controversial, the biggest thing is a switch away from coal and to the one thing that can replace it in the poor countries, which are going to produce most of the carbon dioxide, natural gas. We have to make fracking clean so that countries such as China and India can switch. Natural gas produces one-third the carbon dioxide of coal for the same energy. Uh, if we don't do this, I don't, think, I don't think we have a chance. And if we can figure out a way to do it without it causing earthquakes and lighting our drinking water on fire, I think a lot of, uh, exactly. a lot of people I, will follow I, you down I, that path. I don't think that's hard. It requires more than $3 million fines. But clean fracking, the technology there, is something which I think is achievable, and that's something that we, we really uh, have to aim at, uh, because nothing else can be afforded by the, by the poor countries. Uh, unfortunately, China is already, by the end of this year, producing twice the carbon dioxide of the, the United States, and it's growing very, very rapidly. So we have to come up with a technology that uh, technology that can be afforded by the developing world. Professor Richard Muller of the Berkeley Earth Surface Temperature Project at UC Berkeley, thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight and for being uh, populist enough in your approach to this information that you did it in an op-ed for the New York Times uh, that everybody could read. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, best new thing in the world coming up.